Reflections with theologian Father James Basic, lecturer and campus minister at Bowling Green State University in Bowling Green, Ohio. It seems to me as that we sort of have a battle with the question of hope today. There's so much difficulty in our world. So often our plans seem to fail. We think of things in our country. There was a time when we thought that we could solve the world's problems, and here we've run into all kind of difficulties with that. I think Watergate and Vietnam and the inflation and energy problems seem to weigh upon us. One begins to wonder, well, can we do anything? It seems important in all of this to achieve some sort of proper outlook, or what I would call a healthy anticipation towards the future, a way of looking at the world that can enable us to keep going. And I would like to think at least that there is a wisdom for us in the scriptures that way. Joining Father Basic in today's Reflections is Dr. Eugene Trester, professor at St. Michael's College, University of Toronto. Today's Reflections focuses on the topic of hope in the biblical prophets. Here's Father Basic. Gene, I've had the opportunity to talk to you uh, in the past about biblical matters, and I've been impressed with your own pastoral care that way, the way you're interested in making sure that the Scriptures speak to people now. And I'd like to uh, make an effort to talk with you along that line. I'm thinking of the problem today of hope in our world, and I'd like to relate that to the message of the prophets in the Scriptures. And the way it seems to me is that we sort of have a battle with the question of hope today. There's so much uh, difficulty in our world. So often our plans seem to fail. We think of things going in our country. There was a time when we thought that we could solve the world's problems, and here we've run into all kind of difficulties with that. I think Watergate and Vietnam and the inflation and energy problems seem to weigh upon us. One begins to wonder, well, can we do anything? It's easy to lose hope in that kind of situation. And again, on our own personal lives, we can see that. Many of us keep struggling year after year with particular sins, faults, failings, and we don't seem to make any progress on it. We begin to wonder, well, is it worthwhile, or why should I keep trying any more at all? When that, often when we look at the future, the future seems to us to be a scary matter. I think sometimes in our life we get to a certain age, for example, when things seem to begin to run downhill, or maybe they begin to run more rapidly towards uh, situations that we don't like. They're ultimately, time is ultimately taking us towards our death. The future uh, can appear very dark at times to us in this way. It seems important in all of this to achieve some sort of proper outlook, or what I would call a healthy anticipation towards the future a way of looking at, at the world that uh, can enable us to keep going. And I would like to think, at least, that there is a wisdom for us in the Scriptures that way. Perhaps it's why many people are turning to the Scriptures today in sort of a fundamentalist way. You know, there's a rise in this whole notion of saying, well, the end of the world is coming. You can read the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse, and say, well, you can count it out almost and know that the end time is here. The signs are all present. People will even look at the world situation in Israel, in the Middle East, uh, and, and see signs there that the end time is coming. I think that's a misuse of the, re of the Bible. It's a faulty way of reading the book of Revelation. But again, it relates to this idea of the future. People are... I think when there's a time of great insecurity, when we wonder about how we're going to manage things, when we feel insecure in our own personal lives, that one goes back, many people at least go back to the Scriptures and say, aha, there at least is something we can hang on to, something definite. I don't know, I, you're from Canada. I don't know if you have, feel, have that same sense there of, uh, of the rise of biblical fundamentalism, whether you run into that or whether this malaise I'm talking about, about the future or the scary character of it is real to you in your own experience or your own teaching and so on. I think it's something, something very real, Jim. I, when we're looking at the, the prophets or the book of Revelation you're talking about now, I think what we've talked about some time ago of, of noting that historical character is, is terribly important, that the prophets are situated, that the author of the book of Revelation writes out of a certain time 
facing a certain problem. And in that book particularly, in the prophets and in the book of Revelation in particular, I really need to be attentive to the kinds of imagery the author is going to use at this point, because it's an imagery that isn't all that familiar to me. He uses numbers in a way in which I'm not used to that. I'm, I'm very computer-bound or mathematics-bound. For him to play with numbers or to use numbers symbolically, the number of seven as a symbol for something complete, or the number six for something that's less than complete, something that's imperfect, or to say that 144,000, those are the ones called, those are the ones uh, that will, will enter into the kingdom. I think I really need to understand what, what is going on here, that I'm talking about a, a fullness, and not to take these literally. I, I can do myself, and I think those I, I live with a great disservice in these instances in particular by not being careful and attentive to what we have called the, the literary and the historical forms that, that comes into play very strongly. It would be important for us to remember, therefore, in something like the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, that the numbers are symbolic. I think of the sign of the beast naturally as 666, because 6 is the imperfect number. As you pointed out, 7 would be the perfect number. Then 1,000, I have the impression that represents like an indefinite kind of period, right? Mm -hmm. And yet we have had throughout history p people picking up that notion of the millennium, the thousand years of peace or the, the reign of peace that would come. Again, it's all taking the numbers literally when they really are meant in a symbolic way. Maybe we ought to do just a little bit more with the background of that book of Revelation. My impression is that it's written in the time of persecution, Roman persecution, and it's written as a, b a book to give hope to people who are in the midst of that crisis, correct? That's right. And it, it's almost in a situation where the, the author and his people feel so hopeless that uh, the salvation isn't going to come from humankind. The salvation is going to have to come from God. He's gonna, going to have to straighten this out. But I, I think you're right. At the core of that is a situation of, of persecution, uh, grasping for hope. Where, where are we going to go? And the imagery, well, one wonders why such a strange set of imagery. We have a little bit of that apocalyptic in some of the prophets, but here the, the entire book seems to be in, in such strange modalities. I've so heard symbolic. it that sort of written in code form, that it would be the kind of language that the, the people they were writing to would understand because it makes use of a lot of the imagery from the Hebrew scriptures, from what we call the Tanakh today. Exactly. Exactly, that one really would have to be immersed in that to pick out the innuendos, and on the other hand, perhaps one wouldn't uh, be open directly uh, to punishment from the authorities, that one really isn't criticizing the, the Roman government. Hence, one often finds that in times of persecution, the writer might change the time referent, pretends as if he's writing, from another age and adapts even the name of uh, a respectable figure at that time. Mm -hmm. And if I'm, if I'm reading that literally again, I think that the prophet then is predicting what's going to happen. I think that's one of the very helpful things that modern biblical scholarship has shown us. Uh, the whole notion, when I cluster these individuals and call them prophets, uh, that they really were, were people who spoke to their day. Probably we see people, we see elements of prophets in the people we live with. The prophet seemed to be an individual who's, who was so sensitively tuned that he or she would reverberate with, with injustices. And they, they come at a time when Israel begins to be powerful. There is money in Israel, and we begin to get the haves and the have-nots. And in those prophets, very few of them want to call themselves prophets and step forth mm -hmm. into that kind of an occupation. But they are mm -hmm. people who can resonate, to have at their nerves' ends, they feel for those who are being trampled down. And the prophets then are people who speak in that time to Israel mm -hmm. and call her to task. She should measure up. Is this what Yahweh had in mind, that you should live this way? Rather, you should be sensitive to your sisters and brothers.
So not so much predicting the future. I think that's the obvious notion that people have connected in their minds with prophets as one who predicts the future. And therefore, if you read the apocalypse or the various prophecies in that way, you end up thinking that you are getting a literal prediction of what's going to happen many years later. But uh, according to modern biblical scholarship, that is not the case. The prophet is one who speaks for God, Yahweh. In fact, that Greek word prophetis means that, to speak for. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the notion of the Hebrew word for prophet, which is what, nabi, is that right? That's right. Say nabi, it means what, the messenger of God, the one who has brought God's message to us. And so their characteristic phrase is, thus says the Lord. And what you're emphasizing in your remarks is that they're speaking in the social and historical context of their time. So if you were around listening to one of these prophets, you wouldn't be saying to yourself, boy, he's telling me what's going to happen thousands of years ago. I'm not in, uh, from now, I'm not interested in that. But you would be saying, he's speaking to me. He's telling me uh, w about my life now. And the major thing he's telling me is to be faithful to the covenant made between Yahweh and his people. When we say covenant, we go back to Mount Sinai, right? And that agreement made between God, Yahweh, as the Israelites call him, and the people with Moses as the mediator, in which the characteristic phrase is, I will be your God and you will be my people. It was a covenant of love, right? And I, I think that's important to realize that it wasn't just a, a law-centered agreement, but that it was a covenant of love between uh, God and his people. And I think this is going to be helpful, Jim, uh, when we talk about using modern biblical scholarship in a pastoral sense or in a sense for the people just this notion again of recognizing that the prophet is not predicting the future if I focus for myself and for my community upon the fact that the, the prophet is probably going through turmoil in attempting to get these words out because it's not going to be received well he, he is using a, a very s sensitive kind of language in trying to sensitize people to to what they're not really being faithful to and he's he's calling them forth and often he's asking for change in their lives and I, I find myself and people I I learn with find that the this looking at the scriptures in this way looking at the prophets in this way begins really to to ask questions of myself am, am I willing to be further sensitized to the needs of other people it begins to take on a very pastoral sense I've I've seen myself, I've seen so many people in, in being exposed to that value system begin to ultimately become more like those men and women we call prophets, be, become more and more attuned mm -hmm. to, to the little people in our world. When we're talking about the prophets, maybe we're talking about the men in the Hebrew scriptures, uh, in the, talking about people like Amos and Hosea, right, and Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, those would be the names I suppose right. that most people would be familiar with. We're talking about a period of time. The early prophets would be about the 8th century, right? Amos and, uh, and Hosea. Mm -hmm. um, and Isaiah, what, the 7th, uh, well, 8th century also, right? And uh, Jeremiah, right before the fall of Israel in 586, doing his work. So, and we read about those people in the Hebrew Scriptures. So there's a book of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Amos and Hosea and so on. And what you're saying is that they zeroed in very much on the problems of their time and so on. I was thinking uh, maybe we could look a little bit at Isaiah as being uh, you know, one of the most important prophets that people are really aware of. And again, we're talking about the prophets, Gene, in relationship to our problem of hope today, right? So we're not looking at them just uh, for the purpose of uh, scholarship, but what do they have to say to us in a situation of great insecurity today and where we're trying to keep up our hope in some way? Now, I was just thinking, uh, let's look at Isaiah that way, okay? So Isaiah is, um, is a, a counselor to the king kind of fellow, urbane, uh, city-centered, uh, obviously very intelligent, and his major message, as I'm getting it, is that to stay out of military alliances, that if we got back more to uh, praying to Yahweh, staying close to the covenant, that we would be better off. 
I mean, that, that's true, Jim, that there is always a, a notion of, of the political in there. What's, what's really been amazing to me is to watch Israel when it's down in times of depression, the message of the prophet seems to be upbuilding. It, it mm. seems that that's what the people need. They need that message of hope just to exist. He's, he's carrying them from the bottom up. But yet when they get, uh, when everything is secure, Israel seems to forget the covenant you're talking about before. And then the prophet needs to really refocus and in a sense is calling Israel down again. The prophet seems to be so much in tune mm. with where the people are and continually calling something forth from them. I was thinking of the prophet Amos in that regard. So Amos prophesied in the northern kingdom, right? And it was a time of great prosperity for them. That's right. And he went in and really attacked the rich people That's and right. said that, uh, that phrase I always say, you fat cows of Bashan, as he ta called the wealthy women. And uh, it was calling them to be more faithful to the poor, to help out the poor. And he saw the disproportion in his society and really didn't like that at all. And so, and then d did he not really come up with quite a negative message? They always were looking forward to the day of Yahweh, which in some circles had a positive feel. The day of Yahweh, that God's day would be a good day. Everything would go right and he would straighten everything out. But he had the notion, did he not, that this was a day of doom, of judgment. And God right. came, he would be so upset with the situation that he would uh, mete out his judgment to these people. That's right. It's kind of a scary day at that point. When we're talking about the prophet Isaiah again, one of the helpful things that the scholarship has shown us that we now can talk about three, evidently three different kinds of authors on that scroll. It, it's not like today when we publish, uh, one can publish a book, a pamphlet, or one can publish a huge volume. When things were recorded in, at the time of Israel, one needed to fill a scroll, and we find that on that scroll where the, the message of the prophet Isaiah is, we have at least two other clusterings of messages, and we can find a, a difference there, that portion we call Second Isaiah, uh, chapters 40 through 55, have very much of a, a positive, optimistic, hope-filled notion to them, written quite a bit later than, than the first collection. And written during a period of exile, which comes back to your thesis yeah. that they're very attuned to what is needed at the time. So in exile, it would have been a difficult period in many ways. Although I guess not so bad as sometimes people say, right? I think, it, didn't Israel have it fairly good in the Babylonian exile? That's right. Some were so no. attracted, they, they preferred even to stay. No. But however, it, it was still a difficult time religiously because it appeared That's as right. though Yahweh was not faithful to his promises That's or right. that there's, there's the whole religion which centered on the city of Jerusalem for them and the temple, all of that had been destroyed for them or they were taken away from it. So in that way, they really needed a message of hope, didn't they? That's and right. the man who wrote during this time we call Second Isaiah. We don't know his name. For lack of a better no. name. Yeah. And feeling that he was faithful to the master, Isaiah, the historical figure. But the Second Isaiah was the one who gave us those suffering servant songs, right? That's right. Which, which in a sense, again, we talk about expectation where, as we're looking at the season of, of Advent and the prophet pointing out that expectation for us, what what is the the messiah or the expected one there's there's so much surprise in all this such a, a strong part of israel wanted to be military and wanted to be supreme wanted to be strong as they were in the good days of of king david and king solomon and we see in the prophets their call they're asking for something else but we're not quite sure whether israel is is listening to this and i guess for the christian it's it's such a radical surprise to, to look at the birth of, of the Messiah, to use that word then and to see that the concept has radically changed. Rather than power, one is looking now at powerlessness, weakness. St. Paul talks so strongly about that. And we get the first uh, echoes of that in Isaiah, second Isaiah, in That's right. between uh, what chapters 42 to 52 in there, these four suffering servant songs in which the suffering one is the one who redeems Israel. It's something good comes out of these difficult times, which is surely a message that it was right at the core of their whole understanding, wasn't it? They, 
had this deep belief that Yahweh, their God, would save them despite the difficulties, and that very often the difficulties were seen as chastisements from God, or because they were not faithful to the covenant, that they were punished in this way. I think that's what first Isaiah kept telling the people, wasn't it? Things are going downhill. We're in difficult times. Why? Because we have not been faithful to the law. We haven't been doing what we agreed to do in the covenant of Mount Sinai. And it's interesting to watch that then when once the people move back into the promised land, the whole notion of prophecy seems to take on uh, a whole different perspective again. The, the temple never quite seems to be the same. And the, the prophet's message, in a sense, isn't, isn't as strong. I, Israel seems to be struggling during those final days after, after the exile. And hence, as we were talking earlier, we begin to get the, the whole impact the priestly class really had to reconstitute Israel. Uh, notions of the kingdom and of the temple were so predominant at an earlier age, and now the, the temple was gone, and what was built in its place was so small in comparison as to make even some of those who remembered to cry, to weep mm -hmm. in its presence. And that priestly class, those priestly writers writing in those last centuries, really reconstitute Israel now about the law. The, the Torah was going to be terribly important for Israel. It, it's an amazing people that can e exist and reconstitute themselves. Even in the midst of the greatest disasters, well, we could look at our modern world today and think of the Holocaust in Nazi Germany, which I often feel is the supreme irrational event of of our own time, the thing that boggles the mind the most that a person of faith uh, has the hardest time wrestling with, and yet we see after this period the constitution of the state of Israel and, and the dynamic effort that's gone in to build that up, and of course all the troubles we have now in our world in relationship to that. But you have that same notion that you're talking again about where faith is able to help a people to rebound from the, the difficult situation. You no, know, we were talking about these problems. We didn't say much about Hosea. He's an interesting figure in all this, right? Yes. And he did prophesying in the northern kingdom again in the 8th century and really talking about this faithlessness to, to Yahweh and relating it to his own marital life where he marries this woman who's a prostitute, right? And she ends up being fa not being faithful to him. And he compares that to Israel's relationship to Yahweh. Very graphic imagery. The prophets were good at that, weren't they? Giving us imagery that is easy to remember or yeah. is striking or touches us in deeper levels. Yes, and alongside the, the evident beauty, we also get the tremendous pain this must have meant for the man to use his own marital failure as an illustration. that One just senses how the prophet really suffered for the people, the lengths to which they would go to make Israel listen. Israel had a great difficult time mm -hmm. listening. It reminds me something of, you know, modern day prophets that uh, one of the tests of the prophets again would be whether they would be willing to suffer for their position. Yes. You might think of Martin Luther King and yes. civil rights movement and being willing to go to jail and writing his letter from a Birmingham jail. One might take that as a continuation of the same style uh, that we find in the Hebrew Scriptures. Jeremiah thrown down into the pit and uh, refusing to recant his teachings and, uh, and saying the harsh things like speaking against the temple and against so much of their tradition and saying, no, there will be a new covenant that will be written. So they ended up suffering for... They're what they believed in. This is surely one of the great strengths of yeah. the prophets. And one of the beautiful things for me, I guess, as I look very practically and pastorally at the, the scholarship, is that I'm finding I, I get a stronger and stronger picture of, of Jesus as the New Testament presents him, as the early church presents him, by really understanding his heritage. Those prophets were alive for him. Mm -hmm. As we talked earlier, those traditions were alive, and it's out of this context that Jesus, uh, the man, speaks. He's using his tradition to speak to the problems of his day, and the early church used those teachings to speak to the problems of, of her day also. Exactly. I mean, that's where you get that idea of using the suffering servant notions in order to understand the passion and death and resurrection of Jesus. Very helpful. And then there's the whole Messiah notion that you brought up. I mean, the, the son of David, 
Messianism in Israel, I guess, had two uh, sort of outlooks. One was that the, the kingdom would come, and the other one was what a personal Messianism, that there would be an offspring of David who would rise up and lead the people. But I think throughout it all is the, the notion of hope again. Mm -hmm. While the prophets were not predicting the future, they were speaking to the people of their time, but they were giving them the message they needed to hear. And even in the darkest kind of prophecies, there seemed to be some measure of hope. That's there was right. light in the midst of this darkness, really. And um, this, I think, comes across to us today. So when we're talking about what are we going to uh, say today, we start out by talking, saying we're in a position of insecurity and where many people are worried about the future. And how is the biblical message going to help us? And I think that we don't need to get literal predictions out of it. I think it's destructive, really, to think that the Bible's predicting what's going on today. I find it far more helpful to realize that these people were giving a message of hope in the midst of their situation and saying, Yahweh is faithful. He will never go back on the covenant. If he has chosen you, he will stick by you. He will always be ready to welcome you back. Yahweh's at work in history. God is doing things. He's active. He's all around us. And that's where our trust ultimately has to be placed. So we really, out of the Judeo-Christian tradition, we are supposed to be people of hope. We ought to be manifesting hope to the world, not because we got a solution to every individual problem, but because it makes sense to keep working on these problems, that none of the effort that we expend to improve ourselves personally or improve our society will ever be wasted. And finally, we believe that God will bring uh, fulfillment out of this. He will balance the scales, and he will make sure that the good triumphs over the evil. I think that's finally the message of the prophets, that God's will will be worked one day, and he will see to us that the good are rewarded and the evil punished. You've been listening to Reflections with your host, theologian Father James Basic, lecturer and campus minister at Bowling Green State University in Bowling Green, Ohio. Joining Father Basic in this discussion was Dr. Eugene Trester, professor at St. Michael's College, University of Toronto. The topic of this week's Reflections was Hope in the Biblical Prophets. If you have any questions about today's program or any ideas for topics you'd like to hear discussed, please write to Reflections in care of WLQR, Toledo, Ohio, 43623. Produced in the studios of WLQR, Reflections is directed by Mark Ferguson. Executive producer is Mary Beth Kirshner.